talk about some cool stuff today. The title is very intimidating, um, but I sum it up as saying we're going to talk about brain stuff. That sounds important, right? Now, as we go through, I want, to, I want you to be thinking about a question as we go through the, the slides and as we go through the talk. And to provide this question to you, I want to tell you a little ditty about Jack and Diane. <laughs> They're two American kids growing up in the heartland, and they became analysts. And I want you to picture this in your mind. These are you know, two kids out of college, young, hungry, ready to get into it, and uh, security, that is. And um, <laughs> they're ready to get into it, and they, um, they get jobs as analysts. They both have the exact same level of experience. They're both hired into the exact same job. Now fast forward five years. At this point, you go in and you talk to Jack and Diane, and you find out Diane has far surpassed the skill level of Jack. She is the much better analyst in every way. She's much better at finding evil, uh, describing that evil. She's the better analyst. But they both start at the same time with the same relative skill level, and they had the same job. So why is Diane so much better than Jack? How do you quantify that? Well, let's talk about that. If you don't know me, my name's Chris Sanders. I'm from a little town in Kentucky called Mayfield. That's it right there. That's the whole thing. There's not much there. We got a couple stoplights. Um, my background is, is mostly in uh, defense. I worked for uh, Mandiant, as mentioned, for a little while and recently struck out on my own, a company called Applied Network Defense, um, and I also run a nonprofit called the Rural Technology Fund, and I've written a few books if, uh, if you like to or can read. So what am I talking about today, and what is the problem I'm talking about? I think it's very important to, clear, uh, to clearly state what problem I want to talk about, about how we can address it in this, uh, in this talk. My thesis, if you, if you want to call it that, is that information security is in a state of cognitive crisis. And that's a, that's a big term, and when you use the term crisis, that should mean something, and I think it does, and I chose it very carefully. When you say cognitive crisis, I think you can identify that sort of thing through three specific criteria, and I want to talk through those here. Number one is that the demand for expertise greatly outweighs the supply. How many of you in here are responsible for hiring people right now, especially in the hunting realm? Show of hands. Quite a few of you, right? You know how hard it can be to find skilled, qualified practitioners in this area, right? Many of you are probably, or maybe not too long ago, were trying to find jobs as a hunter. But you know what? If you didn't have any experience, it was also hard to find a job because people only want to hire people with experience, right? They need highly skilled people. They don't need entry-level people. And that's all because we have a little bit of a skills shortage in some degree. The second symptom is that most information in security cannot really be trusted or validated. So we have this real absence of peer review in our industry, right? Most of the information we consume is consumed via blogs, and anybody can post a blog. It can go out of date and nobody will take it down. It can say a bunch of malarkey and no one can necessarily uh, refute it in a way that actually changes that content or influences it. Someone can just refuse to change it. And that's not really a great scenario to be in, especially if you're young, new in this industry, and you're relying on this information to help you advance your career, fight evil, uh, et cetera. Number three is that we have an inability to mobilize and tackle big systemic issues. Look no further than your most recent ransomware infection. I'm of the opinion ransomware is one of the most significant broad spectrum threats that we faced in a long time in regards to something that affects everybody from the big mega corporations all the way down to Joe's bait shop when their computer gets infected. And Joe's a good guy, and he has good prices on bait, so I don't want to, I hate for him to get ransomware on his computers. Now, an interesting thing about this, and I, and I talk about this, I frame this a lot, I frame a lot of things I talk about through medicine, because we're in a cognitive crisis now, and I don't think that's really too questionable. Medicine, we think of as a really, really robust science. Medicine has a lot of problems, but it's not really about medical science most of the time, now that we have evidence-based medicine. It's more about insurance and bureaucracy and things of that nature. But 100 years ago, Right up, almost exactly 100 years ago, medicine really went through this whole cognitive crisis as well. And really, these three symptoms that are listed here, they apply to medicine, right, if you think about it. Demand for expertise greatly outweighs supply. Most towns didn't have a doctor. If they did, your doctor was also your dentist and your vet and maybe sold you milk. Like, if that was the case. You better hope you have a doctor in your town or you're not too sick to make it to a town with one. Most information in the medical field cannot be trusted or validated, and we still have artifacts of that today. Up until 30 years ago, most medical practitioners thought that if you had stomach ulcers, you should drink milk, right? And now we know that's the exact opposite thing you want to do. You don't want to drink milk if you have a stomach ulcer, you're going to have a bad time. 
but it took us until just 30 years ago to figure that out once that was retested and revalidated and we weren't just taking old wives' tales for what they were. And in terms of an inability to mobilize and tackle big systemic issues, uh, look no further than any plague of your choice, right? We have plagues that wiped out a third of Europe, right? That's pretty substantial. So medicine went through a similar cognitive crisis, but they really came out on the other end of it, and we have this concept of evidence-based medicine, where you're doing scientific research, you're having this concept of peer review, and you're taking the creation of knowledge, and it's based upon other validated knowledge, which is something we don't have yet. Now, medicine is a very specific field in how you're trained, right? And I don't think the answer, whatever the answer was for medicine in terms of medical school and residency and all that, I don't think that's the answer for us. But I do think we can look at medicine and how they formalize things and how they research their problems, their cognitive crisis, how they came out of the other end of it. And we can use that to really make judgments and learn things about our own field and our own practices. Right? I think that's a reasonable uh, approach to this, and that's at least my approach. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. That's the problem as I see it and why I'm taking the uh, position I'm taking here. Uh, it's very critical to talk about assumptions. and. Uh, at risk of having people throw tomatoes at me for talking about a definition of hunting, I generally say it doesn't matter what your definition of hunting is as long as you clarify it so people can uh, base what they do on that assumption. So when I talk about hunting, I think about investigations. Uh, and I have this, this thing called the universal investigation process, which I've blogged about and maybe some of you have read about that. Um, and it's really uh, the process that you see on the screen here. Uh, and I'll walk you through that really quickly because uh, I want to talk about where hunting fits in so we can move on uh, and move past that quickly. Um, with any type of investigation, you have some type of observation, right? Um, if you're doing event analysis, maybe that's uh, an alert, pretty straightforward. If you're doing hunting, maybe that's something you've manually found via some type of aggregation, some of the great techniques the other speakers have talked about thus far, something with PowerShell, um, et cetera. Once you make that observation, that's when the investigation begins in earnest. And once you have data to look at, you're asking a question. Right? And a lot of people have alluded to the same thing, questions and hypotheses. You ask a question about that data that will further the investigation. And what you're actually doing is trying to bridge the gap between perception and reality. That's all an investigation is. We want our perception of events that transpired to match the reality of what really did transpire. Perception and reality are two very different things, but we want them to be as close as possible. That's the investigation. So we ask questions to pursue that. When we ask a question, we generate a hypothesis. It's human nature. When we have a question, we lean a certain way, and then we go out and seek answers to test our hypothesis. We seek to confirm it or invalidate it. Either way, we get an answer, and that answer will generally beget more questions. This repeats over and over again until we get a, to a conclusion, which is usually, did something bad occur? If so, how bad and where? And so on, right? That's the universal investigation process. Now, if you look at this, you might say, hey, this looks kind of familiar, and you'd be right it looks pretty similar to the scientific method. And there's a reason for that. We don't have the scientific method because a bunch of old guys sat in a room one day and said, this is how we should do science. We have that because they looked at how scientific discovery in the best scenarios was done, and they mapped it out because they knew if we could take this thing that's occurring subconsciously, bring it into our conscious thought and teach to it, we're giving new people in science a better way to get jump started, and we're giving something that we can teach to, and it's gonna result in more and accelerated scientific discovery. I believe this similar approach can work for what we're doing. And not only have I, do I believe in it, I've seen empirical proof that we can do that. And I'll talk about some of that as we go along. So the key word here as well is universal. And I think that's important since we're at a hunting summit. How does hunting fit in? Um, from my perspective, looking at kind of the uh, cognitive underpinnings of how we do investigations, tools aside, generally the investigation process is mostly the same whether you're doing hunting or you're doing a uh, general alert-driven uh, investigation. The only difference is that observation stage, right? With an alert, I'm giving you something to investigate. You, it's basically giving you your question, right? And I want to be clear on that. An alert is not an answer. An alert is simply a question that you have to go forth and pursue. But an alert gives you a question, and certainly you can do hunting from uh, lower fidelity alerts and things like that, too. But otherwise, if you're trying to manually find observations, then that's gonna be a bit longer process, but it's still all contained within this observation stage. And there's, of course, different strategies for that, some of those which we've talked about uh, here at the conference with other speakers. But again, universal investigation process. So that's what we're talking about here uh, in the context of what I'm gonna speak about next. So let's get to some data. We talked about Jack and Diane earlier, and we talked about experience, right? And a lot of us like to quantify experience in years, right? I have five years experience, I have 10 years experience. When I think we all really know 
my five years experience is probably very different than your five years of experience. Everyone's is. Experience is not simply a measurement of years of doing something, right? It's a completely different thing. So I think it's incredibly important to figure out what that means. What is experience? What separates an experienced analyst, whether it's a typical alert-driven investigation uh, focused person or a hunter, what separates that from someone who is lesser experienced? That's very important because if we know that, we can teach to it. So I did an experiment. Um, I got, I put out a call on my blog and I said, hey, I wanna talk to investigators of all varying skill levels. I think maybe even a couple of you in this room probably participated in that. And I got on the phone or on Skype with them and I, we had a phone call and I had them walk me through at least one of the investigations that they had gone through, oftentimes many, and I recorded it and I did a key phrase mapping exercise. And that basically means is I had a set of phrases in certain categories and I would map the things they said to those categories to try to figure out the breakdown of how they went through this investigation. Now this isn't a perfect research method, um, but it does shed some light on I think the differences between novices and experts. Now really quickly I wanna talk about dual process theory. Uh, this is kind of a big subject, so I'll give you the um, $1.99 description of it. Uh, dual process theory basically says that in our head, we generally have two complementary thought processes going on at the same time. We have intuition, which is fast thought. So when you think of intuition, you think about driving home from work. You don't really have to think about that, you just kind of do it. If I say what's five plus five, um, you don't have to think about that, you just spout out the answer most of the time. Maybe not if you're on stage, which is why I'm not gonna try to answer it and accidentally say 12 now. <laughs> and you also have reflective thought, which is the other side, which is more deliberate thought. So if I say what's 12 times 47, you're probably gonna have to think about that you know, carry the one, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, driving when you were 16 and you were learning how to drive, you really had to think about it, right? You had to think about staying between the lines, you had to think about shifting if you had a manual, all those different things. Two competing or complementary types of thought depending on how you wanna view them. There's a really great book on this called uh, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow if you wanna learn about that. So we have these two types of thought and we have these different categories that kind of fall into them. So you see intuition on one side and reflection on the other. And we'll go through some of those in a minute. The thing I wanna talk about briefly is metacognition, which is the thing you see in the middle. Metacognition is a really fancy word that means thinking about thinking. So thinking about your thought processes, being aware of how you're processing information. Metacognition is critically important. So let's look at the data. Now what you see here are the average number of results uh, amongst the people I talked to. I talk to. Uh, novices, so people with very little experience, are the ones in blue. Uh, experts, are the people with a ton of experience, are in red. Now, there's a lot of data here, like a lot. Uh, I don't even know what some of this stuff really tangibly means quite yet, but there is some of it I think we get some conclusions we can probably draw, or at least some things that the data suggests, which I think are important. Uh, if you look on the left on the intuition side, you see incubation. Incubation basically means you see something a little weird, but you don't know what to do with it. So what do you do when you don't know what to do with it? You just put it to the back of your mind, right? That's incubation. Now, you notice we have a lot larger number of responses related to incubation from novices than experts. And that makes sense, right? It passes the sniff test. If I'm a novice, I'm probably, first of all, gonna see more things that look weird to me because I've seen less things. And I'm gonna see things that don't make as much sense to me, so I'm probably gonna incubate them because I don't know what to do with them. Now, I want you to contrast that with something on the other side of the chart. We see on the right side, we have rule-based reasoning under reflection. And rule-based reasoning should be really easy for this crowd to understand. Think of an if statement. Right, if this, then that. That's essentially what rule-based reasoning is, but in our brains, right? We build this library of rules or heuristics where we take certain inputs and based upon those inputs, we map those to certain outputs. And we see a larger number of responses for experts in the rule-based reasoning section. Also kind of passes the sniff test, right? If you've been doing this for 20 years, you probably have a lot of rules built in to your head where when I see this bad thing, or when I see a dot top domain, I know it's probably evil, right? So. I'm gonna assume that's evil and act accordingly. So it makes sense that experts would have a larger number of those. So I think what we see here uh, to some degree is a bit of an inverse relationship, right? Um, as incubation goes up, rule-based reasoning goes down and vice versa, right? As you build more of these rules, these heuristics to learn how to do investigations, you basically don't have to incubate as much, right? You're not, first of all, you're seeing less things that look weird because you know what those are automatically and when you do see them, you know what to do about it, right? So that tells us, what are those rules? What are those rules that we can boil things down to, right? Chances are a lot of you have probably learned a lot of those 
in the past day and a half watching these talks. When I see this thing, it means this thing. That's pretty cool. The other thing I want to talk about is the middle section, which is metacognition. And this is really neat because across the board, experts generally have a much larger number of metacognition-related responses. They're more metacognitively aware. And this is critically important because there's a lot of really great scientific, peer-reviewed, validated research out there amongst many fields that says practitioners in mentally intensive tasks are much better at their job when they're metacognitively aware. Right? They've done this test with doctors, uh, with nurses, even leaving the medical field. They've done it with lawyers. They've done it with teachers. And they're all better or seen as better in their jobs when they're metacognitively aware. So when they're knowledgeable about, about their own thought processes and when they can apply that knowledge to their jobs. Right? And that's a big part, I think, of coming out of the cognitive crisis and a part of why I'm really speaking here. Right? We talk about how do you become more metacognitively aware? Well, this talk is part of that. It's learning how we think, learning the difference between our novices and our experts and how we bridge that experience gap. Next, what is the X factor that makes a good hunter? I'm sure we all have a lot of opinions on this. I could probably ask 100 people and I'd probably get 70 or 80 different responses. I have my opinion and since I'm the one on stage, I'm gonna tell you what my opinion is. Um, for me, it's curiosity. Right? It's the ability to see things and the desire to go out and do something about it. Right? There's a lot of really fancy definitions of curiosity. I think the best one is simply the desire to know. Right? It's not the ability to know. That's a completely different thing. It's the desire. The desire to see that weird thing and go out and pursue it, go out and run a Google search and figure out what you can find out about it, etc. The desire to know. Now, curiosity is important because it, re it relates very closely to experience in a lot of ways. Right? And I drew this chart up because I think this really describes in a lot of ways how experience and curiosity relate and how they manifest for security analysts, at least in my career. So you see we have a green area and a red area. Uh, surprise, green is good, red is bad. Um, we have the, the top right there where we see high C, high E. That means high curiosity, high experience. Right? These are people who have been doing this for a long time, are insanely curious, and as a result of it, they excel greatly in their jobs. Right? I think you would find most people who you know who have been doing this a while and you would consider really good are also highly curious individuals. Now that's an ideal state, but with experience, we don't all start with a lot of experience. Some of us start with no experience, but curiosity still matters. And that's what we see on the other side of the chart, uh, what I call jumpy. And jumpy is not bad as long as jumpy is directed, right? Uh, and some of us have been in security operations centers where we're the manager or we're responsible for training people and you have you know, someone who is you know, a year into the job and everything looks evil. Right? They're filing tickets all day long, and it turns out that 90% of what they see is actually not evil. They just don't know what they're looking at. And that's okay as long as that's guided and they have mentorship to get through that. Right? So low experience, high curiosity, that's great. Now, notice on the top side, those are both related to high curiosity. Right? You have to have that high level of curiosity. It, the level of experience doesn't matter. You'll gain experience, and I would posit you would gain experience faster if you have that higher degree of curiosity. So our example of Jack and Diane, I would say the thing that separates them is that Diane is generally probably uh, would exhibit higher degrees of curiosity than Jack, and perhaps that's why she was uh, excelling more than Jack. Now there's conflicting variables there. Uh, it certainly could be some other things, right? But that's what I would say if I had to guess and all other variables being equal. On the bottom of this, we see a couple things we're probably familiar with. Um, we see the apathetic area, and we all know people like this who have been doing it for 15 or 20 years, and they've just kind of phoned it in, right? They, they're collecting the nice paycheck. Um, they don't have a lot of responsibility on them. So they've got all this experience, but they're not growing anymore, right? That's apathetic uh, in this job. And then we have the ineffective section, which is very simply low curiosity, low experience. These folks don't know what they're looking at, and because of a lack of curiosity, they're going to have a really hard time getting to the point where they do. Right, so hiring practices, curiosity is something uh, we want to, uh, to look at. Now, I did a little experiment with this too, and I, I used a, a sim across a few different organizations, and I mapped, uh, these were organizations where they have clear delineation between people who are hunters and who are just typical alert-driven analysts. Right, and since this is the hunting summit, I thought this was neat to highlight. And this is the average number of investigation activities per day for those groups. So for four individuals who are hunters versus those who are um, alert-driven analysts. Now, we see a couple things here. One we see is the hunters, which is the orange color there, uh, a lot greater number of general activities in general. When I say an activity, I'm referring to things like searches, pivots, um, clicking on certain things that are investigation-related within the context of the specific uh, tool. 
So we see definitely see that hunters do a lot more things in general, and that's interesting, but I don't think it's necessarily the most interesting thing related to curiosity. But I think this part is. Look at the time stamps below there. Right? How many of you have been you know, lying in bed at, uh, if you're me, at like 10 o'clock at night, and uh, you're on Twitter and all of a sudden po something pops up and you know, some new indicator was released or some new report was released, and you say, oh man, that's neat, I wonder if there's any of that in my data. Right, a lot of you probably. Right? I think that is a good pseudo indicator of curiosity, right? The people who, again, have the desire to know. You found this new thing and you have the desire to know if there's evidence of that on your network, so you go search it out, right? So you see that's occurring you know, late night hours, early in the morning. I'm not saying you have to do those things to be curious and be a, a, a good hunter, right? That's, that's definitely not the case. But I do think that's some tangential evidence uh, that curiosity is, is particularly important in hunting uh, because hunting relies so much on generating observations by yourself as opposed to relying on them um, from alerts. Now, uh, this brings up some interesting questions, right? Um, number one is, can we measure curiosity? Can we objectively measure it? Psychologically, there are tests that will measure that type of thing. They're expensive to do. You have to have someone who is a psychologist basically to evaluate that. Um, they're a little tricky and they're not super domain specific. Um, so can we do that in a domain-specific way? And if we can, can we teach curiosity? Is it something we're born with or we can actually make people more curious? That's a good question. It's not a question for this talk, but my, I would say yes. I think we have to get there, and I think uh, some of us are probably already doing that whether we realize it or not. So curiosity. The next thing I'm going to talk about is the sequence of the investigation. And a lot of people would say that it doesn't matter how your investigation goes, the path you take, as long as you get to the correct answer. And I couldn't disagree more, and I'm gonna talk about a few reasons why. Now, studying the investigation is really, really hard, right? Everyone has a different tool set. We're all running different sims. Some of us have custom-built stuff, et cetera. So this was not an easy thing to study. I had to build a custom tool, uh, an investigation simulator, if you will. I call it Investigation Ninja. And it allows people to go in and get an alert and investigate that in a tool-agnostic manner. They can't just go look at the data. They have to ask the right questions to get at the data. Uh, and I think that's very important because, again, this is question-based. So when they do this, I can go in and then look at their investigations. And this is a pretty neat teaching tool, too, when you can review your own investigation uh, and how you went through that process. But I can go through and review these, and at this point, it allows me to do some actual science, right? I can define an independent variable and see the effect of that on the dependent variable. Controlled experiments, that's awesome. So that's what I did, and I want to talk about just a couple things I found from that um, here. Uh, the first thing, question I ask is, too much data a real thing? A lot of us have the problem of not enough data, not enough visibility. But too much data is a real thing as well, and I want to talk about that, uh, particularly in relation to uh, packet capture data. Now, I love packet capture data. Like, I, I literally wrote a book on packets. Like, I love it. But I will say, it is not, I don't think it's always the best thing to start with, and, and there are good reasons why. So I ran an experiment uh, with a group of folks, and I had an investigation. And I said, okay, go forth and solve this investigation and I measured time to close. So the time from when they started to the time that they came up with the correct disposition. And you see that on this chart here. Uh, and what I did is I measured based upon the opening move. So when I say opening move, I said, what is the first data source someone looks at? And how does that affect their time to close? You see on this chart, it took people significantly longer to get to the correct answer when they started with packet capture data. Well, that's neat. I love packet capture, but that's not a good thing, right? So, so let's compare this to something else. Let's compare this to a similar type of data source. Packet capture is a lot of data, right? It's a lot to sift through. It's very time consuming, et cetera. So I said, let's take bro data. We all know bro. It takes a PCAP and distills it down to just really important uh, particular assets or facets of the PCAP. So I did that, and I took the exact same scenario, replaced the PCAP data with the bro data. So what do you all think happened, right? Did the time to close go up or go down? Well, it would be a very crappy presentation if it went up. That wouldn't really prove my point. Uh, it went down, right? It normalized it. So in this case, it brought that time to close down on par with flow, flow and OSINT information. Right? So that suggests some things. And when I say it like this, it sounds a lot more obvious. Better organization of high-context data sources can yield improvement in, uh, in analyst performance. So this isn't to say PCAP's bad. You're not going to find too many people who love packet capture more than I do. But it means you probably shouldn't start there, right? It means you should start with constrained uh, time frames, constrained host. Don't pull 10 minutes of PCAP for a whole network segment. 
Don't pull an hour of PCAT for an individual host. Narrow down to the specific time frame you need, the specific host you need, and start there. Flow data is a great way to do that, right? Uh, um, there's a, a talk coming up a little later on flow data that I highly recommend you watch because flow data is amazing. I would say I love flow data more than PCAP data, and I know that's a little sacrilegious, but it is what it is. Next question, and this is a new one. The, uh, the experiment I just talked about, I've done a write-up about that on my blog. If you want to read more details about the methodology, it's all out there. Now, <laughs> for the next question, I ask, what data transformations are most often used in positive findings? And I did this specifically for learning more about hunting. Now, I started out, and I looked at all of the declared incidents I found that were spawned from an alert. So someone had an alert, they investigated, and it led to uh, an incident. Right? And most of these, I will say, are just commodity incidents. We're not talking about really high-level nation-state stuff. And I, I looked at these four types of data transformations. Right? I'll, I'll go through these really quickly. Uh, a pivot means you have results from some type of query, and you take a field from that result and use that to search in a completely different data source. Right? So like pivoting from flow to PCAP. An aggregation is taking a specific uh, field within a data set, so like, so let's say the user agent field, and sorting on all the unique values. So that's an aggregation. Uh, expansion and reduction, simply making a search and then reducing or enhancing the scope of that search. Uh, and visualization is pretty self-explanatory, visualizing the data in some type of uh, hopefully useful way. So for alert-driven investigations, we see here, first of all, expansions and reductions were used 100% of the time. That's what that, that means right there. Uh, pivots were used quite a bit, 76% of the time. Aggregations only 23% of the time, and it's hard to see visualizations, but that was less than 1% of the time. Now, this is fairly interesting in itself, but let's compare that to hunting. So I did the same data review, but in this case, I did it for specifically for cases I found where it started with someone manually hunting for observations and then going through the investigation process to find something bad. So here's what that looks like. Now, in this case, you see, again, expansions and reductions, still 100%. We've got those going on all the time. We do have... Quite a bit more pivoting as well, right? That makes sense. You're going to be doing a lot of that. You're not going to stay within the concept, uh, the context of one individual data source. Uh, and the thing I thought was really interesting was how many more aggregations went on. And what I found anecdotally, uh, it's not represented here, was that most of these hunts generally started from some type of aggregation. Just like the one I mentioned a second ago where you're taking all the user agents in your organization uh, and sorting on those and looking for the least frequent occurrence, and that's an outlier, right? Uh, the great talk earlier about the, um, uh, the shim cache parsing and that, that awesome tool and how it did some of that for you, that's amazing. That's the kind of stuff hunting often starts from. So we see aggregations are a much bigger part of that. We see visualizations still not a big part of that, right? And I will say that th this was a case where visualizations could have been used, uh, but were generally not used in a way that was meaningful. So this isn't a, a way for me to say, damn all visualizations. I don't think that's the case at all. Uh, they just weren't used tremendously here. So I think this is neat. I think this points out a little bit of the difference, um, what little difference I think there is between hunting and alerts in terms of how that actually manifests in dealing with data. And also tells us a little bit more about what maybe we need to teach to and build to, right? If aggregations are so important, well, we darn sure better make sure the folks we're training know exactly what one is, how to build one, make sure we have tools that allow them to do that, and help them find great locations within the data to do that in. Right? Just listing out places where aggregations make sense and doing those on a periodic basis. So, pretty neat. Uh, so we're gonna wrap up here. Um, one of the questions I get really often is how can I do similar research? And I think that's important. Uh, this research is hard. I'm having to build custom tools to do some of this research. And I think the best way I can encourage folks here is simply through the concept of positive deviance. Uh, if you haven't heard of the concept of positive deviance, uh, very simply, it means, you know, if you look back at most of the significant changes or uh, positive events that have occurred through history in our field or in any other, they've been traced back to someone who is considered a positive deviant. And that means a couple simple things. Number one, ask questions. Ask questions of the world around you, right? And this applies well beyond just threat hunting. But look at, look at your sock, look at your data, look at how people are interacting with your data with sincere focus on that last part. Not every compromise has the same threat actor has, has threat actors, has human threat actors in it. They don't all have malware. They don't all have threat intelligence. They're not all related to hunting. They are all solved with humans. And I'm very thrilled to see that that was the common thread amongst all the talks I've seen thus far, is human at the center of the investigation. The human will always be at the center of the investigation uh, for as long as we're all alive, and I'm certain of that. So ask questions of what you see in the world around you. When you do that, don't complain about it. 
right? It's very easy to look at something because you're probably asking questions about it because you don't like it, right? Don't complain about it because complaining is not useful. Instead, take that energy and apply it towards measuring something. The key to doing anything positive in life, I feel a lot of the time, is measuring something so that you can actually see if it's a problem and learn about that problem. That's exactly what I did in some of these scenarios here, is measured something to see if there's something that can be done about it or to enhance it. Once you measure it, write about it, right? Even if it's not something necessarily consequential, you know, there's not a significant finding, write about it so that other people can see you measured it. That way they don't have to measure it if it's not worth measuring, or if that you did measure it and it's worth doing something about, they can also do something about it. And finally, don't be afraid of change. And when I say that, I don't mean necessarily trying to change whatever you've measured, but also changing yourself. If I've learned anything through my study of the brain, it's that mindsets are incredibly quick to form and entirely resistant to change. And in my opinion, that's one of the bigger problems in the world at scale today, is that mindsets are very resistant to change. One of the things I've learned through teaching my investigation theory class, where I, I do and I have people go through a lot of these simulations, is the people who are very new to the field, they really excel in the class. Right? They really embrace the concepts and they learn about how to investigate. The people who have been doing this for a long time, they really struggle. And that's because mindsets are quick to form but resistant to change. We have a really hard time unwinding our brains and unwinding how we've learned to do things. But I think if we really want to approach this from a very fundamental standpoint where we actually really understand our thought processes, if we know, scientifically we know that's important, it requires a little bit of change, it requires a little bit of positive deviance. Thank <laughs> you.